Greetings, welcome to Learn to Burn Studios. My name is Eric Stevenson, and in today's video, we're gonna talk about lost PLA casting. Okay, so as you've seen from some of my, pre in my previous videos, I've been talking about, you know, casting this skull. Um, in this case, this is one of the cast, finished cast iron uh, pieces I've done. For the most part, we've been focusing on lost wax casting. And the reason why we typically like to use lost wax is that burning out wax is very consistent. It's a nice, easy material to make castings of or to uh, make patterns of out of our rubber molds or plaster molds or whatever we're working with. But the waxes generate a very nice pattern. Um, they're also easy to you know, sprue and work with and manipulate. And if, if you're going for consistency, it's definitely still the way to go. But with new technologies, you know, the abilities to do you know, scanning, 3D modeling and whatnot, and then ultimately having 3D printers at hand to generate new patterns, there's been a, a lot of interest in using you know, 3D printing as a way to generate as a replacement to our wax patterns. And where this really comes into play is that if you're still just starting off with a, a, a straightforward object, in this case the skull, if I want to make, make a bunch of skulls you know, at, the, at this size, the most efficient way is still going to be lost wax. If I start extrapolating that pattern and doing some crazier stuff on it, horns, you know, carvings into the surface, whatever, and more specifically if I want to enlarge that skull or shrink that skull, that pattern, then a combination of 3D scanning, modeling, and printing really come into play, and, and that's really where you know the advantages of. And we'll focus on that you know a little bit more in some future videos. But in this for today's video, I want to talk about you know just the the, the simple transition for, between wax and utilizing PLA. So the first steps we'll need to do is actually to make this a, a PLA pattern. First things I'm going to do is take this iron pattern and do a 3D scan of it. Uh, for the iron skull, um, I went ahead and spray painted it white. Now, typically you don't necessarily need to spray everything white. There are vanishing sprays you can use um, or other surfaces that you can you know, apply to something as a temporary coating. It will allow you to capture the best scan data. The scanner I use is a Peel 3D version one. And the way it works is that it basically projects a QR code, a black and white gridded pattern over the surface of your object. And then as it bounces additional lasers off of them, it catches that distortion that's happening in the, th in, the in that black and white pattern to extrapolate, you know, the, the 3D mesh. And so in doing this scan, started off with the skull sitting straight up. And then once I got that scan, flipped it over, did the sides, did the up, you know, inside the core, the back, the top. And the more different angles you can get from the scan, you can actually then take all those scans and merge them into one homogenous thing. Because realistically, as you're working around one surface, it really works best when the, the, the light from the hand unit hits the surface perpendicularly. And just realistically, and move it around, and whether it's the articulation of your own wrists and hands, you know, I'm working on a pedestal here, but ultimately, even with, with using a lazy Susan or something, anyway, it, it becomes difficult or almost impossible to actually capture all the different you know surfaces in just one scan so realistically you want to hit it from multiple you know at least th say three different directions and then you can kind of you can merge them together and it's nice that the software that comes with the scanner and so on that does just that it'll merge them together and so i can see and if i if i realize after say merging three layers to, three scans together i can see if i'm missing an area and then go ahead and Rescan that area and then merge that additional scan data into um, into the, the larger mass and stuff to kind of fill in my holes. So it's really nice to have that kind of flexibility with that software and in particular with that scanner. Although a lot of scanner softwares work in, in a similar fashion. Then export that out to. I usually put it through a mesh mixer just to clean up um, oddball anomalies you know, turn triangles, any kind of holes I might have missed, and then take the export for Mesh Mixer as an object or an STL, and then push it into uh, your slicer of choice. 
and then 3D print it. In this case, I like uh, the, my printers are uh, from Folger Tech. They're uh, kit printers, uh, the FT5. Uh, starting off with the kit printers actually was a nice way to go because I really learned the nuances of 3D printing. You know, not only obviously how to build them, but you know what breaks, you know what goes wrong, how to fix them, all these things. But also, it really started me off as a decent price point. Printers these size out of the box can be you know a bit on the pricey side and maybe less approachable. Uh, but these kit printers, um, and this one in particular, I think it was like you know 400, 500 bucks, and so it gave it, it was it was enough to allow me to kind of jump into these techniques um, and, and and into this this process. You know, when we're talking about lost PLA, inherently uh, some of the PLAs that have that are you know a little bit richer in color, you know bright colors, you know certainly the reds, the blues, yellows, different things. Some of the pigments that they use in those filaments, you know, might not actually burn out as well. So I found that regardless of the the brand name of filament that you use, you really want to get you know utilize either. Um, basically the neutral color, you know, the, the PLAs that don't have a color additive in them. The polycast that I'm using um, specifically for that reason doesn't actually have a color in it because it's meant to actually be burnt out and utilized for, for this purpose. Um, it actually uh, prints re really nicely. It's real, I like it because it's really nice to clean up. I actually kind of like the matte surface that's inherent of it. Um, it's more uh, facilitates sanding and cleanup. Uh, one thing you want to you know be careful of sometimes is the amount of infill you use. If you make your if you make your PLA prints too dense in PLA, obviously that's more material you need to get rid of during the burnout. But the the opposite end of that is if you if your infill is say only like five percent or ten percent, you have a lot more of you know inherent air inside your pattern, and when you're dipping this into a liquid or into the liquid slurry that extra air is one going to make the pattern more buoyant and want to like, you know, float and potentially rip away from your spruce system. So if your spruing's not up to snuff and stuff like that, it could cause some problems. Um, but it also can force a situation where you have air leaking through the surface of your perimeter layers that can either create anomalies um, and or premature shell cracking. Now that, to prevent actually some of that air escaping, one way to get around that is to, you know, certainly maybe spray paint. If nothing else, maybe you know, I'll do occasionally a, uh, some paste wax to kind of seal that up. One of the perks of the polymaker material, in particular the polycast, is that it's their what they do their their poly smooth category. So you can spray it with uh, um, isopropyl isopropyl anyway rubbing alcohol. You can you can spray it with rubbing alcohol, and it'll slowly kind of diffuse and kind of average out that surface but also by doing so it actually kind of melts those the outer layers together and creates a more homogeneous coat that will prevent that air from escaping and you know potentially messing up the ceramic shell but yeah once we have our 3d pattern then we'll go ahead and obviously pop it off the pop it off the build plate clean up all the you know all the support material uh, which is you know used for creating this as a hollow casting or, or, or hollow hollow pattern Give it a quick little sand, and I'm curious to actually, you know, see how well the, or, or to show, you know, the kind of detail the, the ceramic shell can pick up. So we're not, I'm not going to smooth this pattern. We're going to leave it, and so we can see all the detail that we can pick up in the ceramic shell. So now that we have the PLA skull prepped, our next step is to sprue, and we'll tackle that in the next video. So as always, if you've gotten something helpful from this video, hit the like button. If you're digging the content, subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Until then, be creative and be safe.